Welcome, my friends, to the Depression to Expression podcast. Scott St. Marie here. Welcome back. If you're subscribed, if you're not subscribed, (laughs) oh, we got a treat for you in previous episodes, but a treat for you today, sitting down with, yes, the one, the only Dr. Daniel Amen, talking about how we are going to end mental illness. This is the future of brain health, this episode. This is what you're going to learn. The future of brain health, the end of mental illness. We're going to talk about single photon emission computed tomography. Yes, right? You haven't heard of SPECT scans? Oh, come on. We got to measure blood flow in the brain if we're going to end mental illness. We actually have to get uncomfortable. And this is what Dr. Daniel Amen and I talk about is what's wrong with psychiatry today. There's a lot wrong. Pushing pills, is that really the only answer? Do we understand what depression and anxiety actually mean? Is there a cure to ADD, ADHD? What do we actually know? And here's here's what's interesting. And we go through all of this in the podcast. And let me tell you, if you haven't seen his TED Talks, if you haven't seen Dr. Amen on stage, he's an incredible speaker, incredible doctor, incredible human being. Because when I when I watch his talks and I've been following him for years, I kind of think, okay, when I meet him, you know, via the Zoom call, who knows how he's going to be, right? You never know how people act on stage and when they're on TV, how are they going to be one-on-one? And man, you can tell, and, and, and I said this to him, like, you can tell that he is still so passionate about helping people, about, he's a, he's a child psychiatrist too, about helping children, about helping young adults, adults, it doesn't matter who, he is passionate about helping people. And that just struck a chord with me because mental health is absolutely my passion. So in this episode, we dig deep into how we need to shift perspectives and healthcare and talk about brain health rather than mental illness. He doesn't even like the word mental illness. In his new book, The End of Mental Illness, all his links are in the bio if you want to learn more about how Amen Clinics is changing people's lives and changing how we see mental health. I'm so fortunate to have sat down with him. As I always say (laughs) with these episodes, buckle up, man, because we're going to hit some hot topics in this episode. Dr. Amen, thank you so much. And let's get going in three, two, one. Dr. Daniel Amen, thank you so much for coming on the Depression to Expression podcast. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. So I, I actually, this is perfect. Right behind you are the many books that you've written over the the last many years and the the one end of mental illness that's a bold statement i love bold statements i love it what can you tell us about the end of mental illness and the kind of uh, the kind of work you do if no one has heard of you before all the listeners what would you like to tell them about the work you do to end mental illness so at Amen Clinics, I have eight soon to be nine clinics across the U.S. Uh, from Bellevue, Washington, where we see a lot of people from Canada or New York, Washington, D.C., um, three in California. What we realized uh, based on our brain imaging work is that most psychiatric problems are not mental health issues at all, but rather they are brain health issues that steal people's minds. Get your brain right and your mind will follow. Since I've been a psychiatrist nearly 40 years, I have always hated the term mental illness. It's shaming, it's stigmatizing, it's demoralizing, and it's wrong. These are brain health issues. If I get your brain healthy, well, then your behavior is better. Your feelings are better. Your ability to learn and love are better. And no one cares about their brain. Why? You can't see it. We screen almost every other organ except the brain. I'm in a new docu-series with Justin Bieber and I've been Justin's doctor for a number of years, and he's he's a worldwide superstar, which meant some days he'd do what I asked him to do, and a lot of days he wouldn't. Uh, and then he came into my office about a year and a half ago, and he said, I think I get it. My brain is an organ just like my heart is an organ. If you told me I had heart disease, I'd do everything you said. 
I'm going to get my brain right. And then he went on and just got dramatically better. You know, most people who see cardiologists have never had a heart attack. They're there to prevent them. What I'm really trying to do is create a revolution in brain health because that is how we will end mental illness. I think that's fantastic. And in in a lot of ways, psychiatry has come a long way, like with the work you do, seeing the brain, yes, as an organ. But unfortunately, and I'm sure you see this in, in work and with colleagues too, that that a diagnosis for mental illness is still completely what the patient will tell you and disclose. And it's based on the the vocabulary and semantics that someone can express to then give you a, a diagnosis. This is what is way too common with the people that I speak to. And even in my experience with a psychiatrist, do you see this a lot in, in your work and see what's going on in uh, around the world? Are we still back in the 1800s with diagnosing people? So how did they diagnose Lincoln when he was depressed in 1840? They talked to him, they looked at him, they looked for symptom clusters and then diagnosed and treated him. That is still what's happening around the world. And the problem with that is depression is like chest pain. Nobody gets a diagnosis of chest pain. Why? Because there are many different causes. And if you don't properly identify the cause, treatment won't work. In fact, treatment can hurt you. For depression, there's clearly not one cause. It can be from grief. It can be from loss. It could be from low thyroid, low testosterone, from Lyme disease, from heavy metal exposure to mold. Giving everybody antidepressants um, in large scale studies have been found to be no more effective than taking a sugar pill. And it's why psychiatry has a bad rap. Um, in the hospital, psychiatrists are the most diminished of professions and they don't like to know it, but my wife is a neurosurgical ICU nurse. And when the psychiatrist would come on the ward, she'd just sort of roll her eyes because <laughs> it's this soft science. And when she, um, we, we had our first date, she almost canceled it when she found out I was a psychiatrist because she didn't want to be psychoanalyzed even though she needed it. <laughs> um, it. We diminish ourselves. Why are we the only medical specialists who virtually never look at the organ they treat? I mean, who else does that? Nobody else does that. And, and you'd probably agree with me depression is just as serious as cancer. Depression is just as serious as heart disease or diabetes or obesity. And it steals people's lives. It steals their relationships. It steals their ability to love or excel at work. And when we embrace this new paradigm of brain health, people's moods get better. It's just one simple example. I think I've been involved in three big innovations in psychiatry. One, imaging, if you don't look, you don't know, stop lying. Natural ways to heal the brain. And we'll talk about some of them, but like your food really does matter. Um, in a functional or integrative medicine context. So if you wanna keep your brain healthy, or rescue it if it's headed to the dark place, you have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind. And we know what they are. There's a mnemonic in the book called Bright Minds to help people remember them. Well, I had a patient who was severely depressed, had ECT, electric, electroconvulsive therapy, three times. Um, and he tried like 17 different medications. And I'm like, well, have you ever tried an elimination diet? And his brain looked terrible. And he's like, what's that? Well, I want you to eliminate gluten, dairy, corn, soy, artificial dyes, and sweeteners, and sugar. And you don't have to do it forever, but for a month. And he had failed so many things, 
he's like, if it'll make my brain better, I'll do it. And within three weeks, he's dramatically better. And so then we add back gluten. Nothing happened. He's fine. We add back dairy. Nothing happens. He's fine. We add back corn. He said within 20 minutes of eating the corn, he had a vision of a gun in his mouth pulling the trigger. And I'm like, oh, you have to break up with corn. Yeah. And I love corn is what he said. And I'm like, well, now that's just an abusive relationship. You love something that hurts you, that's trying to kill you. You know, we need, this is like a psychotherapeutic moment. You have to, you can't be with some thing or someone that's trying to kill you. That's just not rational. And so anyways, he broke up with corn. How many people, is it really their diet that's driving their bad feelings? There's this great study from Australia we looked at two outer islands. One had fast food restaurants. The other one didn't. They measured their omega-3 fatty acid levels in their blood. The island with fast food restaurant, significantly low levels of omega-3 fatty acids in their blood and five times the level of depression. It's wow. the food. Yeah. Yeah. And, and let's talk about omega-3 since we're on the topic of, of depression. And you, this is so... You could argue that it's such a complicated problem, but then sometimes the sim the solutions are relatively simple, like the elimination diet. Let's get back to a basic, let's call it a Mediterranean diet almost with high high fats, uh, good fats, right? Maybe low in in refined sugars and caffeines. Like I was on antidepressants for 12 years. I got off them recently because it was a massive diet change amongst other lifestyle changes and exercises. But it's difficult because with mental illness, let's just call it that for simplicity's sake, or brain health, we don't connect it to the body. We cut off the head and then we'll treat this part right here. So is this is this difficult for you to actually continue doing what you do knowing that it's still being treated this way? Can you sleep at night? Because you're fighting all the time. You're like, no, we have to look holistically and the, the brain is an organ. Let's do the spec scanning. Let's do all of this. Is it changing fast enough for you? No, it's so slow. But why? Th there's a lot of resistance to change. I mean, people don't want to change anyways, right? Once you start something, it's really hard to stop it. If you're having a drink of vodka every night, you know, when you realize you really shouldn't do it, it's sort of hard to stop it. Um, 40,000 psychiatrists across the U.S., are dependent on a treatment model that makes diagnoses based on symptom clusters with no biological data. And big pharma has big resources in Washington that make this the standard. And so if you take insurance companies and big pharma and the 40,000 psychiatrists that are wed to the status quo, and anytime you try to change things in the book, I talk about the structure of scientific revolution. It's like, well, how do scientific revolutions happen? Because this is a revolution. Yeah. And it's actually there's a five step process and we're between steps four and five. Everybody knows there's a problem. Um, lots of really smart people are going imaging, genetics, lifestyle changes are critical um it's just getting people to actualize it that is the problem and big pharmaceuticals they're on wall street what's wall street interested or insurance companies they're on wall street what are they interested in they're not interested in profit five years from now they're interested in quarterly profits and without quarterly profits their ceo gets fired and imaging lifestyle diet supplements there's an investment there but with the investment, we hospitalize 90% fewer people uh, if they come to Amen Clinics. It's rare for us to put someone in a psychiatric facility where if all you're doing is 15 minute med checks, it becomes commonplace. Uh, so um, 
I don't like it, but a long time ago, I realized I can do what I can do. And we are changing it because we have 7,000 patient visits a month in our clinics. We hold the world's largest database. And so I'm not gonna worry about what other psychiatrists do. I'm gonna be like Gandhi said, you have to be the change you want to see. And so um, I used to think, oh, I'm not smart enough to change a whole profession. And then I got the epiphany I am changing it in our way. And a lot of people talk about our work and we have a lot of haters and it's like, oh no, that's all witchcraft. And I'm like, seriously, I'm looking at the brain and you're not, and you're calling me a witch. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there must be, there must be people going after you. Are you a, are you popular in the psychiatric field as far as, you know, receiving criticism? Is this what happens a lot to you? Oh, well, it used to be a lot more. I mean, I used to get called all sorts of bad names, like a charlatan and a snake oil salesman. And then I real snake oil is actually 23% omega-3 fatty acids. So <laughs> it didn't bother me that much. But we've had over 10,000 medical and mental health professionals refer to us. So, you know, when people go, nobody loves them. I'm like, no, we get a lot of love. And in 2016, Discover Magazine listed our research where we could separate PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder from traumatic brain injury with high levels of accuracy. They rated us as the top neuroscience story in science that year so um so plenty of people love us uh and i mean we have the best published outcomes so we actually do a formal outcome study on every patient we see so on average people have 4.2 diagnoses we're complicated most of the people you know who have quote mental illness it's add anxiety depression and an addiction that's just sort of the common story where they have ptsd and a panic disorder and depression. Um, So on average, 4.2 diagnoses, they failed 3.3 providers and five medicines. That's the average person who comes to us. At the end of six months, if we treat them, 84% are better. And we're really excited about that. And that's the number we focus on. How do we improve outcomes? Because that's what I care about. I don't really care if you're diagnosed with depression because, you know, it's not telling me why. Right. Um, One of the big surprises for me, I mean, it still blows my mind. I really think I'm a head trauma clinic (laughs) that Hmm. having an undiagnosed brain injury. And I'd ask you, Scott, um, before you were depressed, had you ever had a brain injury playing football or soccer, car accident, falling down a flight of stairs. And you cannot believe the number of people who suffer with ADD, anxiety, depression, addiction, suicidal thoughts, personality disorders that had a significant brain injury before they started having psychiatric problems. And often people go, no, I didn't, but I see it on the scan. And so I'll push, and you can't believe the number of people said no. I had this kid with Tourette's. It's actually a funny story that, um, you know, Tourette's is a tick disorder where people have both motor, like movements, um, and vocal, <clears throat> clearing their throat, sometimes puffing, blowing, whistling, even swearing. Um, and he had a tick disorder and he had an addiction. He was coming off drugs. He came to my clinic. And because of his head tick, you have to like lay still for 15 minutes to get the scan. We want no movement, right. otherwise it blurs the image. And so we couldn't get him. So I actually climbed on top of him, took off my wedding ring and held his head so we could hold him still while he got scanned. And so now we're bonded, if you will. And so I'm like, hey, stay with me. Let's look at your scan. And he had a damage to the left front side of his brain. The only thing that does that is head trauma. And I'm like, so why don't you have a brain injury? He said, I didn't. 
And then I start going through the list and he was irritated and going through drug withdrawal and pretty soon no 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 turned into f no and i'm like oh but you know i grew up in the grocery business there are plenty of people swore around me so it doesn't really bother me yeah. that much and i kept pushing f no f no f no and then all of a sudden he stopped and he said does a motorcycle accident count I'm like, what happened? He said, I was riding my bike around a lake and I saw a baby deer come on the road and I didn't want to hit the deer. And I spilled the bike onto my left side, broke the helmet and broke my left jaw. Do you think that matters? F, yes. I said <laughs> <there>. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, and nobody knows this, but I did the big NFL study. We scanned and treated 300 NFL players at a time when the NFL was lying that they had a problem about traumatic brain injury. And they have four times the level of depression in the general population. Yeah. And, and ho have you done any work with, I'm, I'm guessing hockey players can be similar as well. There's been a lot of suicides within the NHL as well and people dealing with depression. A lot yeah, of advocates come out of that. Yeah. Hockey players. My favorite one is Paul Correa, who's in the Hall of Fame. He's from Canada. Um, had headaches every day for 12 years. And when he came to us, yes, he, he, I mean, you, you can actually Google on you know YouTube, see some of his concussions. They're just wicked. Yeah. And three weeks later, he didn't have con headaches anymore. Um, put him in a hyperbaric chamber, put him on a group of supplements, got him to love and care for his brain. And that's ultimately what I want for you and for people listening. The end of mental illness begins with a revolution in brain health. You need to love and care for your brain. We have a high school program called Brain Thrive by 25. It's in all 50 states, seven countries, including Canada. And we had an independent group study it. And we basically are teaching kids to love and care for their brain. Um, decreases drug, alcohol, and tobacco use, decreases depression, and improves self-esteem. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, th there's, it's difficult it, in the advocacy work I do, and, and I'd love your thoughts on this. The end of mental illness, everything you said is, is absolutely fantastic. I personally believe this is the way to go. And the evidence you see, things need to change. It's quite obvious that what we're doing right now is not working. What I see happening is people become, they, they get diagnosed and say, aha, I have major depressive disorder. That's what it is, right? And they'll be put on medication. They start to feel better. And what happens is this is kind of the new normal and they'll find community with others going through the same thing. Sometimes misery loves company, but also you want to empathize with others. And then they become attached and identify to the illness and can't let go because you've then based your life around this label it's a really difficult thing. So I feel like sometimes people might not even want to detach from that and heal in a different way if they're okay with medication. Are you interested in getting people off of medication or are you interested in just people coming in who are, who are not doing too well in the moment? Well, I want everybody to come in and look at their brain and get excited about brain health. And I'm not opposed to medicine. I'm just opposed to that's the first and only thing you do. Like I wouldn't be yeah. opposed to medicine for diabetes, um, but I do my best to get you to change your diet and manage your diabetes without medicine. But if you can't, I'm absolutely gonna use medicine. You know, if you have bipolar disorder and lithium or lamicto really works for you, please don't go off of it. Like, um, because having untreated bipolar disorder can cost you your life, your marriage, your job, and so on. So we have to be thoughtful, careful. So I always say, I'm not crazy. <laughs> um, I think I use all the tools in the toolbox. And if you need medicine, 
great. We'll just light candles at church and be grateful for it. Um, if you can do it with diet and that's your preference. See, for me, I just believe in informed consent, that my job really isn't to tell you what to do. My job is to properly diagnose you. And if I don't look at your brain, quite frankly, I don't know. You know, we need to stop lying about that, that you can pick out complex psychiatric disorders with no biological data. That's the ultimate in narcissism and hubris. It's, it's the ultimate that I can be, that I can actually read your brain um, yeah. by what you tell me. Um, I had a fight once with the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, who is a re who is a brain imaging researcher. She goes, oh, the brain has language. I don't need a scan. I'm like, are you insane? The brain is never going to tell you you have sleepy frontal lobes or your cellophorum <laughs> doesn't work or you have a cyst in your temporal lobes. I'm, I'm just like, I feel like I live in a time warp with stupid people. Um, well, no, I, I can I can I can believe you there. But the majority of psychiatrists don't have those tools. They don't know the first thing about diet. Rarely someone comes out of a, a psychiatric consultation and says, yeah, they told me to, uh, you know, get rid of gluten, uh, you know, dose up on the B B12s and omega threes and stay away from sugar for a bit. It's usually a patient goes in, they want something to make them feel better. And it, I think it's a, a lot of, uh, um, just the human condition. You go in somewhere, you want to leave with something tangible. Right. That's easy. It's that's simple. That's fast. Um, but um, we make something, for example, called happy saffron that has saffron, curcumin, and zinc. And a lot of psychiatrists, they have no clue about natural supplements and they'll go, oh, there's no science. Well, the problem, the saffron and happy saffron, there's 21 randomized controlled trials head-to-head -head against Prozac, Zoloft, Effexor, Wellbutrin, Amipramine, showing it's equally effective, but rather than knock off your libido and your sexual function, it promotes it. And our first four testimonials on Happy Saffron, one of the headlines was Viagra for Women. <laughs> and it was so popular, we ran out of it. People were so mad at us. Um, but we're now doing this study because I want to improve your sexual desire and function. Because if I give you an antidepressant and I've just damaged your sexual divide, desire and function, well, that actually makes you more likely to be depressed because you won't want your husband to touch you. He may go have an affair. And now all of a sudden you're in the middle of a crisis and nobody's thinking it's the psychiatrist 15 minute med check that may have in fact ruined your relationship because if you guys are bonded sexually and then you're not, that can cause big stress in a relationship. Right. And, and it's, it's this, the model of, of, you know, we've been told the story of it's a chemical imbalance. Again, the cut off the head, let's treat just the brain and not realizing like, I'm amazed. I thought it was common knowledge that people knew that the majority of serotonin was created in the gut, but that isn't common knowledge. It's not how, common knowledge. Now, how do, how do we get this? How do we get this out? made in your gut is not necessarily what works in your brain. So that's important to know. But there is this huge gut-brain connection. And what most people don't know is if you take an antibiotic, so I had a cyst, uh, a tooth abscess uh, recently, and I had to take penicillin for a week, and it's sort of irritating uh, because I know antibiotics change your gut microbiome and actually decrease the amount of stem cells that the hippocampus makes. Why is that important? The hippocampus is two large structures in your brain responsible for mood and memory. And every day in a healthy person, they make about 700 new stem cells a day. And the hippocampus is Greek for seahorse. And so I think you're like making 700 new baby seahorses every day. Well, when you're on antibiotics, you're just 
genocide for the babies. And if you don't put your brain in a healing environment, say you're smoking pot every day, you're drinking every day, you're eating fast food every day, you're in a pandemic and you're under chronic stress every day, it's murdering those babies, making you more likely to have both cognitive problems and mood problems. And would you say that when people come to to the Amen clinics, are are you? I guess you're obviously not opposed to providing the medication, but when does that come into play? When it, when is it okay to give someone? Let's just use depression for example, to to give the medication. Is this kind of the last resort where you're going to try this and this and this and this, and then medications last? How do you come up with that decision? Because your toolbox is larger than let's say the average psychiatrist. You, you know, again, it goes back to informed consent. It's this is what's going on with your brain. And then we assess those 11 risk factors, the bright minds I talked about earlier, blood flow, retirement and aging, inflammation, genetics, head trauma, toxins, and so on. So we're assessing you. So before we re recommend what to do, we really have a complete picture, not just here, and, and I would argue, you know, they're not really doing here because they're not looking. So they're not <laughs> yeah, fair doing enough. here. They're doing out there. Um, you know, it's what they say. My wife says this about me or I feel sad. I mean, it's just, um, what's the right word? I'm trying to be not gross, but. Um, well, I think just, it's a little self-righteous. A mess. Yeah. What's going on now? We're going to look back on this period of psychiatry and be embarrassed by it. That, um, yeah. But, anyways, I, I think back that to your point time. about drugs. Yeah. Back to your point about drugs. Once we really get, and that sort of depends on how serious. If you're psychotic, I'm probably going to, you know, I'm going to search on some supplements for sure, and I'm going to talk to you about diet. And I'm going to probably give you a little abilify. Um, if you're manic and I can really see this cyclical pattern, I'm going to give you lithium or labectol um, and then the other things as well. So it depends on the level of severity, but it also depends on what you want. You know, mm -hmm. that's why I think informed consent is so important because some people, they don't trust supplements. They really want a pharmaceutical. Other people, pharmaceuticals, the last thing they would ever uh, consider. And so then we do the other way. And I'm always thinking about you. Like if you came to see me, I'd want to know what's going on with you in the four big circles of life. So your biology, <coughs> that's your brain and your body, your psychology, how you think and your development. So important. We live in a society of undisciplined thinkers. Um, I call it ants, automatic negative thoughts that drive depression. Mm -hmm. And my aunt eater around here. I love that. Oh, here. Um, we, we live in a society of undisciplined thinkers. So here's the end. I'm also a child psychiatrist, so I have puppets. That's <laughs> and, um, you know, you don't have to believe every stupid thing you think. A lot of depression is driven by the bad thoughts people have. We need to develop an anteater. So to get rid of these bad thoughts, uh, so whenever you feel sad, mad, nervous, out of control, write down what you're thinking. Ask yourself if it's true, if you um, really know if it's true. So I'm a huge fan of cognitive therapy. Yeah. The social circle, who you hang out with, because people are as contagious as COVID-19. Um, if you hang out with depressed people, you're way more likely to be depressed. If you hang out with positive people, you're more likely to be happy. Um, and then there's the spiritual circle with no psychiatrist wants to talk about, except 80% of the population has really deep rooted spiritual beliefs. And quite frankly, I want to know why you're on the planet. What is your sense of meaning and purpose? And a lot of people never end up dealing with the death 
dragon. Um, we're all going to die. And it's that sort of amorphous anxiety people struggle with. But Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said is um, the denial of death that is responsible for people people living empty, meaningless lives, because when you believe you're going to live forever, you don't take care of the things you need to do today. Mm. And so the spiritual circle, I think Viktor Frankl would call it meaning and purpose, that is critical. So to get you optimized or well, I need to help your brain be better. I need to help your mind be better need to help your relationships be better. I always think of myself as a family psychiatrist. If I see a new person, I want to meet their spouse. I sort of want to have a conversation with their mom and dad. I want to know because people only have one view and I need other views in order to get a real whole holistic picture. Um, and then I want to know why the heck you care, why you think you're on the planet. I think I th I think that's it comes from a place of compassion that you really love what you do obviously because you've been doing it for so long and you you still have fire about it. I need to know what you're eating cuz I you're in your 60s and I hope I look like you when I'm in my 60s. Let's just put it that way. You have amazing energy, mm -hmm. Dr. Amen. Um but let let's rewind a bit because I I, I remember on your Instagram or you tweeted something it was like it, stigma mental illness is very very real. People don't seek uh, getting help due to these social factors. And let's just call them misconceptions too about what this actually means, brain health versus mental health. But I think a lot of people in my experience don't seek help from psychiatrists because they don't want to be just fed a pill and be labeled. And in the one area of medicine that needs complete and 100% compassion and love, it's lacking. Why do you think that is? Or do you think that is? I, I'm just speaking from the people that I've spoken to over the last 10, 12 years. You, you know, I've met great psychiatrists. We have 45 of them that work with us that are just wonderful people. They're kind, they're competent, and they're passionate. And, and I have colleagues. So, so I wouldn't put everybody in that bucket. But since since I was trained in the early 80s, and when I was trained, we'd get an hour a week with patients. Well, because of managed care and how psychiatrists are reimbursed, they actually make more money in 15-minute med checks. And so they really went from being a primary care doctor for their patient to a mechanical cookbook physician that is not rewarding because a lot of people don't get better. And um, it became about the money. And it's quite horrifying. Uh, the level of burnout, not among my physicians, but the burnout in my profession is really high because, you know, you're really going to spend your day giving medication and then medication to treat the side effect of the medication. It's you just came down to one hammer for a whole profession. And you end up not really being physicians, but pharmaceutical reps uh, for the drug companies. And I, I don't know, that's just not fun for me. And I was there during the transition to managed care. And I hated it. And it was 1992. I stopped taking insurance. I'm like, you want to see me? You have to pay me. I'm not doing this because I didn't feel like it was in the best interest of my patients. I actually went and got another job because, I, you know, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. But it um, turned out I actually ended up getting busier uh, because people want that kind of care. Yeah. And it's so clear that that a lot of people aren't aren't getting that need of either in their social circle or from from the doctor that they go to. Out out of all these spheres that we talked about, there's the social, there's emotional, there's the psychological, and there's brain health, and let's just call it physical health. Is there something when you see see clients say for anxiety and depression that's let's just call them the most popular? Is there some circle that that is always 
lacking? Is it their social life that just isn't up to par? Are they, is it their diet that like nine times out of 10, it's like, yeah, you're not eating right. That's like probably going to be the case. Is there some outlier that's always there? No. Um, the common underlying theme is they don't love their brain. So a long time ago, I coined the term brain envy. Uh, when I first scanned myself in 1991, the week before I scanned my mom, and she was 60 and she had a perfect, beautiful brain. She was actually our model, healthy brain. And it reflected her life of seven kids, 50 grandkids and great grandkids. And she's just everybody's best friend knows everybody's birthday. Everybody, I don't even know everybody's name. And I scanned myself a week later and it looked sort of like crap. <laughs> I played football in high school and meningitis as a young soldier. I was overweight. And I just, I didn't care about my brain. I'm a double board certified psychiatrist. I'm board <laughs> certified in adult psychiatry and child and adolescent psychiatry. I was the top neuroscience student in medical school. Did not care about my own brain. I could get four hours of sleep at night and thought I could function just fine, realizing I was special. And then when I really realized that I realized I wasn't special, I was stupid. And so I wanted my mother's brain. So I had brain envy. And I realized Freud, who coined the term penis envy, was wrong. It was about two and a half feet too low in the body. I've not seen one case of penis envy my whole career. Um, <laughs> but I've seen so many people who have this deficit in brain envy that when you fall in love with your brain, you treat it better, it functions better, and then you're better physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. If there was, if there was one, I, I shouldn't just say one, if there were a few tips and invitations you could provide listeners who deal with depression and anxiety at this moment, what, what, what would that be? I know it's impossible well, I mean, to fit it all in, but... Let's say they well, all have brain envy of uh, Dr. Amen. Well, so um, I have all sorts of tiny habits in the end of mental illness. Uh, my favorite tiny habit is whenever you go to do something, just ask yourself, is this good for my brain or bad for it? Three seconds. That question takes three seconds. And if you can answer it with information and love, love of yourself, love of your brain, love of your family, love of your mission, love of your money. Um, if you can answer that question with love, you're going to begin to get better. Um, when I wake up in the morning, every morning, it's actually at the top of my to-do list. Today is going to be a great day. I just say that as a mantra. That way my unconscious mind will find why it's going to be a great day. When I go to bed at night, um, I close my eyes, say a prayer, and then go, what went well today? And as I review the positive things about my day, it sets my dreams up to be more positive. For all of my patients, I do lab work on them. Can't change what you don't measure. If you're depressed or anxious, you absolutely should know what your thyroid is, what your ferritin level is. That's a measure of iron storage, high iron, your body rust, low iron, you're anxious and you can't focus and you're tired. Well, you know, you're really gonna take Xanax for that? That's mm -hmm. a bad idea. You know, you need more ferritin. Um, so it's maybe more iron rich foods. Um, I wanna know your testosterone levels, your hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of blood sugar, your inflammatory markers. I'm serious about with a better brain comes a better life. And my anxious patients, often undisciplined thinking, they're masterful with the ants, especially the fortune telling ants where they're arbitrarily predicting things are gonna turn out badly. Um, I love this book by Byron Katie, who's a friend of mine, Loving What Is. Um, when you learn to love what's going on in your life, your life is so much better. 
but usually mm-hmm. depression is in or in the past with regret, anxiety, or in the future with fear, learning how to anchor yourself to the present moment. I'm a huge fan of hypnosis, of meditation, of diaphragmatic breathing, just as a way to retrain your nervous system to be better, healthier. Um, And I think we should actually be teaching second graders how to do this. Absolutely. I think there's a, a, there's quite a few schools, uh, mindful schools that are, that are teaching meditation. And you did a study, is this correct? You did a study with Andrew Newberg. Is that correct? Did I get the name right? A whole Uh, bunch. And Andy and I are friends. We were just texting earlier Years ago, years ago, I did a, 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 a university paper on meditation and I saw it like this was uh, well, 10 years ago in 2000, 2008, so 12. But it, yeah, that name popped up and he was doing all of this different imaging with meditation and how it alters the brain. And you are you know him well? I do. Yeah, no, we played table tennis together. We're fierce competitors. And <laughs> no, I, I love him. He did the original studies on Tibetan monks and Franciscan nuns. He's in this great movie I love called What the Bleep Do We Know? Uh, about the impact of thoughts on our minds and on our lives. Um, And we did a study together on a Kirtan Kriya, uh, Kundalini Yoga form of meditation. It's a chanting meditation, Sata Na Ma, Sata Na Ma, 12 minutes, and balance the brain, calm down the emotional brain, activated your thoughtful brain, And if you just did that 12 minutes a day for eight weeks, it actually strengthened your resting frontal lobes, which is sort of a good thing because your frontal lobes is the executive part of the brain. It's sort of like your mother when you're a grown up, but you still have hopefully a good mother in your head going, oh, please don't say that to your wife. (laughs) Oh, no, don't do that. Um, (laughs) Do you really want to eat dessert before you have dinner? That's just a bad idea, right? (laughs) So it's having a supervisor in your head. And when you damage your frontal lobes, it's like you grow up without a supervisor. Right. I, I, I feel so fortunate to have to have chatted with you about this this is unbelievable it's it's the present but it it is the future of psychiatry and and brain health and the absolute end of mental illness thank you so much for for coming on and 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 chatting with me i really appreciate that well scott what a joy to meet you thank you for all that you're doing to get the word out about how we can be better Oh, I am on your team 100%. And if you'll invite me, I'm, I I play. I've been playing table tennis for 15 years. Okay, I can. We'll, we'll bet if we'll bet some money. Okay, we'll see what happens. Um, is is there that. anything else? Is there anything else that you'd <laughs> like to uh, to say to the audience? Um, where can we find you? I'm going to put all of the links in the description on YouTube, my friends, on on iTunes, on Spotify. Um, we'll put a link to the, the latest book as well, but, um, I know there's quite a few sites for Amen clinics. Well, so amenclinics.com, Amen like the last word in a prayer clinics.com, um, at doc Amen on Instagram, uh, Dr. Daniel Amen on Facebook. Uh, I often go live during the pandemic. I've been live about 75 times. Craziness. Um, <laughs> And yesterday, this great live chat on mismatched anxiety. If yours is low and your partner's high, how can you be helpful rather than hurtful? It was really Ooh, fun. I like um, that. We have a podcast, my wife and I. We've got eight and a half million downloads. Uh, it's called The Brain Warriors Way, Brain Warriors Way podcast.com. They can listen to us there. We've done about 700 of them. Uh, um, so plenty of places for them uh, to learn more about our work. You and your wife must have some incredible chats at the dinner table after work. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and the pandemic, you, you know, a lot of people don't know is 80% of families feel closer to each other. The, there, there are a whole bunch of good things about the pandemic. People are rethinking their lives. They're not in traffic as much. They're not hitting their heads with uh, soccer balls as much. Um, 
So, so there are good things, but the thing I really love is the extra time with my wife and with my kids. And, and I've here heard that from yeah. a high percentage of my patients. Well, there's a lot less FOMO as well, especially with teens and kids in elementary school. Where it's like, I'm not invited to the party. Well, there is no party anyways. We're all doing the same thing right now. We're all on our phones at home wishing we were doing something else. We're all on the same page, it seems. So I, I can understand that for sure. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Amen. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll stay in touch. Great. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Well, this is the first outro I've ever done. I know, weird, right? You're like, the episode was over. We don't want to hear from Scott anymore. But hey, just just chill, chill, chill for a sec. I got to say a few things. First of all, thanks for making it this far. I hope you learned a lot in this episode and are taking some things with you, not only to ponder, to think about, but maybe some action to take when it comes to those daily habits that actually he does himself as hey, I do the same things as well. Now, if, if you did enjoy the episode, what would mean a lot is if uh, if you're on iTunes, leave a cool little review um, remember, this podcast is ad-free and sponsorship-free. Notice that there were no breaks in the podcast for ads or sponsors, so a seamless listening experience. So share the love. I'd love for you to just take a few minutes and write a review or share the podcast. And, and you know, if, if you truly believe in, in this message to end mental illness and look at brain health, I, I think this could benefit a lot of people. So go ahead and share, my friends. Send me an email, say hi, follow me on Instagram, Facebook, check out my YouTube videos. It's all there, all for you. Take care.